This time on Mystic Britain, Marianne and I try to discover the secrets of the horse. No, not this one. This one. The Uffington White Horse. A mysterious giant thoroughbred carved into the hills of southern England. I use magic to uncover its ancient mysteries. Here I go. Won't I fall over if I no, do that? I'm sure you won't. No. While I translate the subtleties of ancient texts, it says that wise is an idiot. I impress the local pagans. Sorry to disappoint you, sir. <laughs> and I get to grips with the anatomy of the horse. And what do you call this bit? A beak? Whiskers? All in an attempt to discover who created this incredible creature and why. The British Isles have a very long history. People have been living here for tens of thousands of years. And the further back you go, the more elusive and mysterious the lives of those ancient Britons appear to be. Do you believe in magic swords? Uh... Who were these ancient Britons? Hello, Paul. Hi, uh, Clive. What did they believe? What was their world like? I can see you as a dynamic uh, Boudicca figure. Flame hair, violent, <laughs> vengeful. <laughs> as a talk show host, I should know how to ask a good question. So how do you cure bubonic plague? Pigeons. Pigeons. But answers are not really my strong suit. Did Arthur fight many watermelons? Ah! So I've roped in someone... Bye-bye! ..with more insight into the ancient world than I'll ever have. Mary-Anne, do you like old things? I like you. <laughs> Anthropologist Mary-Anne Ahota. You've got a bag of big toes. Yeah. Your job is weird. Together, we're going to unlock the mystic secrets of the ancient Britons. Oh, this is a life I could take to this. You are in for an absolute treat. Yes! I'm a mystic and here's mystic. <laughs> Perfect line for the whole series. <laughs> Of all the ways our ancestors left their mark on Britain, none are as impressive or as baffling as the giant carvings cut into the chalklands of southern England. From the, well, imposing Sir Abbas giant to the guardian-like Long Man of Wilmington. You certainly wouldn't call any of them inconspicuous, which makes it all the more embarrassing when you can't find one yourself. Right, so I'm looking for a white horse. It's around here somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. No, nothing so far. I'm on the hunt for the most ancient of all the chalk carvings, the Uffington White Horse, a huge, mysterious piece of land art steeped in legend, folklore and magic. Unfortunately, it appears that one of its magical properties is to completely disappear. It should be somewhere here in the aptly named Vale of the White Horse, a few miles southwest of Oxford. It must be in the right area. It's a white horse high on a hillside, visible for miles. Well, I found the car park at least. After an hour's walk and after no more than three or four phone calls, I finally spot it. Sort of. Well, I've tracked it down. Here is the Uffington White Horse. It is oddly positioned. The natural place you would carve the horse would be on the, the wall of the hill. But in fact, it's on the ridge. It's quite difficult to see. You've got to, I'm getting a stiff neck just trying to look at it. Well, I, I would do if I had a neck. People are having to go into hang gliding or aeroplanes in order to see what's going on. Obviously, I wanted to jump into a hang glider myself, but I was told I couldn't something about being too old and too inexperienced. Shame. Luckily, we've got the next best thing. A drone and special permission to fly it. From up here, you can see just how impressive the horse really is. It's
It's an elegant, stylized, almost Picasso-like creature, around 360 feet long, with a distinct beaked mouth and a curious square head, at odds with the rest of its fluid body. So who built it? And why here? What was it for? If only there was someone here who could give us the answers. And as if by magic, there is. David Miles was chief archaeologist at English Heritage, and he spent decades studying the white horse. So there's the horse, but why, why here, do you think? I think it's because the landscape here is just extremely dramatic. First of all, it's the highest point around. Yeah. Uh, it's only about a 1,000 feet high, but it feels higher. Yes, it feels very epic, doesn't it? It does. You're close yeah. to the sky, yeah. the land falls away. We're halfway between Earth and heaven. Yeah, anthropologists would like to call this a liminal landscape. Yes. A place where you're close to the heavens, you're on the edge of the Earth. So, great spot. According to David, this whole area is packed with myths, legends, and prehistoric features. So what's this shape here called? Well, you've got this scarp here. Yeah. It's now carved into these great folds, which are called the giant staircase. Yes. People looking at it have just said, oh, that looks like a staircase yes. that a giant might use. Yeah, that's right. These glacier-carved landmarks aren't the only mystical feature in the area. Right next to the horse is the site of one of Britain's greatest legends. This is Dragon Hill. You've probably heard the story, especially if you're English. Back in the Middle Ages, a dragon was terrorizing the country. Along came a chap called George. He slayed it, rescued the princess, and became the patron saint of England. His cross forms part of the Union Jack. Well, this hill, this is where the dragon was killed. That's right. It was where St. George fought the dragon, and uh, behind us we could see the white patch where the dragon's blood was supposed to be shed. Yeah. But I suspect that the dragon legend might be older. I think that yeah. the Anglo-Saxons would have seen this as a, a treasure mound yeah. guarded by a dragon. Maybe right. that's where the dragon story first appeared. As for St. George, his story actually comes from Libya. But let's not let the facts get in the way of a good yarn and a great tourist attraction. Besides, all this talk of dragons has got me thinking. Well, is it a horse? Is it a dragon or some well, other animal? Other people may have seen it as something different because I always feel if you go and stand down the valley over there yeah. in the evening sun, it almost looks like it's flying out of the yes. top of this hill. And you could see it as a dragon. But all the evidence suggests that it was meant to be a horse. It's a galloping horse. That's right. So David is convinced it is a horse. And who am I to argue with someone who spent his life investigating this rather enigmatic creature? But who built this mighty steed, and when? And what was it for? Marianne? The truth is, Clive, the debate about who created the Uffington horse has been raging for centuries. To find out more about when our horse first began its mystical journey across Uffington Hill, I've come here to Oxford, to the Bodleian Library, which is one of Europe's oldest. If it doesn't have the answers, nowhere will. Inside the Bodleian's distinguished halls are the records of one of the silliest feuds in the history of academia. In the 17th and 18th century, some gentleman scholars got their knickers in a twist over the mystery of the Uffington White Horse. This is the original Monumenta Britannica, written by the pioneering archaeologist of the late 17th century, a chap called John Aubrey. And he reckons that the horse was created by the early Saxon kings in around AD 500. And he says this, the white horse was their standard at the conquest of Britain. So it was a kind of we was here monument saying the Saxons are now in charge. <laughs> Seems plausible. This makes the horse around 1,500 years old. But not to some of Aubrey's fellow scholars. They thought his ideas were, well, a pile of horse manure, really. 
The next theory came from Reverend Francis Wise, who was an academic and theologian who actually worked here at the Bodleian Library. And he wrote this, a letter to Dr Mead concerning some antiquities in Berkshire. The upshot is that although Wise also went for Aubrey's giant commemorative plaque theory, he reckoned it was made a few centuries later by one of Britain's most famous rulers, King Alfred the Great. And that's when things got really heated because of a rival theologian called Asplin, also based here in Oxford. He penned a pretty blunt rebuttal called The Impertinence and Imposture of Modern Antiquaries. And he let rip with both barrels. Basically, it says that Wise is an idiot, and if he only looked at the back of an Iron Age coin, he would see pretty much the Uffington horse. So clearly, the Uffington horse must be Iron Age, not Saxon. The Iron Age began more than a 1,000 years before the Saxons arrived, which means the horse is way older. So, was Asplin right? I need to hunt down one of those coins. While Marianne is hunting for treasure, I'm going to try to find out what our stallion, or mare, was actually for, using a little magic. All right, here I go. The Uffington White Horse, a beautiful but enigmatic ancient carving in the Chalk Hills of southern England. But just how ancient is it? Who made it? And what were they thinking of? On that last subject, it seems some of the locals have some very strange ideas. Not least that the horse has magical powers. Ruth de Wilton was born in the shadow of the White Horse and grew up steeped in this local folklore. And this is the eye of the this horse? This is the eye of the horse, yes. yes. And you, this is a lo your local horse, because you, you were brought up on a farm over yes, there? Yes, yes, brought up on Britchcan Farm over yeah. there, yeah. And did it involve coming up here on a regular basis? Yes, I really enjoyed coming up here as a child, mainly. But people didn't just come up here for a pleasant walk. So talk me through the idea of what you do on the eye of the horse. The saying is that if you stand on the eye of the, the yes, horse yes. and you turn around clockwise three times and wish, yeah. your wish will come true. Oh, really? And uh, what wishes did you <laughs> attempt? <laughs> I remember really wanting a piano one year. All right. And uh, that seemed to work. Yeah, you got the piano. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. So I turn round, it has to be clockwise. Clockwise, eyes shut. Eyes shut. Won't yes. I fall over if I no, do that? No, I'm sure you won't. OK, all right, here I go. I'm wishing away. Good. <laughs> Arsenal for the treble. Arsenal for the treble. Come on, White Horse, work a miracle for me. Can I open my eyes now? Yes, open your eyes. All right. Oh, the wish hasn't come true. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, you're not allowed to randomly trample all over the horse. I received special permission for my wish as Arsenal willing the treble really is a matter of vital national importance. Sadly, any solid evidence of magical powers is flimsier than the gunner's current defence. But it's clear that even today, the horse remains very special to the people who live here. It's an amazing landmark and an amazing special place. While Clive's wishing for the impossible, I'm heading a few miles down the road to Sirencester in my hunt to find out more about the horse. Back in the 18th century, scholars got quite hot under the collar when it came to establishing the horse's age. And one academic, the Reverend Asplin, claimed he'd seen the horse on an ancient coin. Then his argument was the horse was at least as old as the coin. Here at the Corinium Museum, there's a collection of those rare Iron Age artefacts. Wow, look at this. Can I pick this up? Yeah, absolutely. So, is this solid gold? Yeah. We it think is... it weighs probably about 2.6 grams. So, what we've got here, to my eye, is a horse that looks rather like our Uffington Horse Hill figure. Absolutely. I mean, that's not a kind of anatomically accurate image of a horse, that's a kind of symbol of a horse. And I think there's very much a sense of movement, mm. very similar to the Uffington horse. And we end up with this uh, very stylized design, and that's very specific to the Dubuni, to the tribe here. 
The Dabuni people were a Celtic tribe who settled near Uffington during the Iron Age, around 2,000 years ago. But the white horse itself was on someone else's turf, a neighboring Celtic tribe called the Atrabates. Would the people making these abstract horses on their coins have had an understanding of the Atrabates' big hill horse? Absolutely, I'm sure. Uh, you know, that motif, that emblem, we think can be seen for over 20 miles. You know, is it a territorial marker? Um, it has that sense of movement. You know, it's, it would have been very iconic then as it is now. The fact that this stylized design appears on coins made in a region so close to the horse does suggest that our learned scholar, the Reverend Asplin, may have had a point. However, indelicately, he made it. So just how old is this coin? There's a clue on the other side. B-O-D-V-O? Yeah. Me? We think this is a, a local leader of the Dubuni, and the name is Bodvok. Bodvok. And we think he is a, a, uh, a king, a local leader um, of an elite group of a, a, around about 30 BC. So this coin suggests the horse was in place long before Anglo-Saxon times. It's at least 2,000 years old and was already a local landmark in the Iron Age. This is the time in British history when we actually start having a history. I mean, there's always been history, but it was only when the Romans arrived that it was actually written down. Either way, this means the Uffington White Horse is very old indeed. Right, Marianne. So you're saying Iron Age people would definitely have known our white horse. But what would it have meant to them? Did it form part of the Celtic tribe's pagan beliefs? What I need is a pagan. And it seems in these parts, pagans are a bit like buses. You wait all day for one to come along, and then a whole load of them turn up at once. We call to our lady, Rihanna. Goddess of this sacred place. For priestess Christine Clear, being a pagan isn't a part-time job. She's a shamanic practitioner 24-7, so she really does know her stuff. Thank you, everybody. So, Christine, we're gathered here right by the, the white horse. Is this a regular haunt? I, sp I suppose I'm asking you, do you come here often? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way to end. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we meet here probably four times a year, three, four times a year, at particular times in the calendar when there's uh, specific rituals within the Celtic Wheel of the Year. Right. Well, when you say we come here, so w w what, are, w what group are you? We're kind of an informal little group called Mist Dancer, yeah. um, because the mist is where we go into a liminal state and into the other world and so on and so forth. Oh, right. And we dance through the mist into our ceremonies. Yes. So it's rather too sunny and bright today, then. Well, it's a then. little bit sunny and Sorry bright, Sorry to yes. disappoint you with this lovely <laughs> late autumn sunshine. <laughs> but whatever the weather, Christine's convinced the horse is special. The horse, as she runs across the hill, is kind of a goddess and represents, for me, the goddess Rhiannon. What, the scantily dressed pop star? From the Welsh mythology who's a, a sacred goddess of the land. And... And is there an image of Rhiannon in your mind? What does she look like? Does she look like a horse, for example? No, 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 no. She looks like a lady who's riding a horse. OK. Who has the ability to take us on a journey into the other world, should we choose to follow her. These may be 21st century pagans, but you can easily see their Iron Age counterparts standing here doing something very similar a few millennia ago. So we turn now to the east. Oh, oh, the other east, yes. Thank you, everybody. Well, I better go before they get me as converted as a newt. Where am I? Oh, yes, it's the Uffington horse. There are obviously many people who believe this place is home to some powerful energies. After all, if people hadn't revered, worshipped, and looked after the white horse from when it was first carved into the chalk, Mother Nature would have claimed it back. The grass would have grown over, and it would have disappeared. Today, local people still turn out once a year to take part in the tradition of scouring the horse. 
National Trust ranger Andy Foley has been leading the charge of its upkeep for 10 years. Yeah. And what do you call this bit? A beak? Whiskers? Beak, whiskers. Um, it's open to interpretation, but, uh, yeah, I, I go with whiskers because I firmly believe it's a horse. <laughs> So is there um, a technical skill to this, or am I literally just take the grass out of the chalk? Yeah, the old term is called scouring, and another phrase for, for weeding. And, yeah, we're just going to pinch it out with our fingernails, try and make sure the root base comes out as well intact. OK. Right, a bit like this. And yeah. then you're just going to throw it in the bucket. How often do you have to do this, Andy? Well, it's a year-round job. Obviously, in winter, we're more monitoring it. But the actual chalking of the horse is preceded by a scouring in June. And then we chalk for five days solid in July. Wow. It's incredible when you think about it. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, people have been turning up to give the horse a good grooming. But it isn't just a haircut. The chalk also needs to be refreshed regularly to maintain its luster. That's quite an investment of, of time and effort, then. Yeah. Just to keep it white, to keep it showing on the hillside. Yeah, it would involve people from the surrounding villages coming up at the request of the squire or the Lord Craven to come and chalk the horse, and then they were promised a celebration afterwards. Nice. Plenty of uh, cider and dancing. Cider and gin, most likely, were the, the last recorded one in 1857. Perhaps too much gin because it was declared the last one because it became too rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my kind of party. But even without that sort of encouragement, it's clear people have been caring for the horse since it was first created. We know the horse was probably here in the Iron Age, more than 2,000 years ago. But could it be even older? Luckily for us, the horse has finally given up its age, thanks to a helping hand from Adolf Hitler. For thousands of years, the Uffington White Horse raced gracefully across the chalk hills of southern England. That was until 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland and the world went to war. That changed everything for our horse. To prevent German bombers using it to navigate to their targets, the Ministry of Works unceremoniously buried the horse under turf. By the time the war ended and the turf was removed, the horse was a bit worse for wear. So in 1951, the Ministry of Work sent an archaeologist called William Grimes to tidy things up. Now, Grimes did a very naughty thing. While he was cleaning up the horse, he also dug a trench to see how it was made. Now, he didn't have permission to do that, and because he didn't have permission, he didn't tell anyone he'd done it, and he didn't tell anyone what he found. It wasn't until 30 years later that Grimes' illicit adventures in archaeology were finally exposed, when someone stumbled across his notes in the archives. What they revealed completely revolutionised what we knew about the Uffington White Horse. Experts had assumed the horse had been created by cutting through the turf to expose the chalk beneath. Grimes discovered the horse was a lot more sophisticated, a series of deep trenches packed with layer upon layer of chalk stone. The brains at Oxford realised that if they could date the bottom layer, they would finally know just how old the horse really was. Dr Julie Rees-Jones was one of the archaeologists involved in the project. So, Julie, where were you taking your samples from? So I took samples from a trench that was dug here at the belly of the horse. Uh, OK. And found that there were lots of layers of chalk there, cutting into each other, going back in time. Quartz crystals washed into the chalk from the surrounding soil absorb natural radiation at a known rate. So what we do is deposit the crystals that we separated onto little discs like this. To the naked eye, that's smaller than a grain of sand. Uh, yes. Where does that go? So that then goes in a machine like this to be measured. OK. And that machine is where the magic, or what I like to call science, happens. A process called optically stimulated luminescence makes the quartz crystals give up their stored radiation as light. The longer the crystals have been buried, the more they glow in the machine. 
and hey presto, it was finally possible to say when the very first layer of the Uffington horse was laid. What results did you get? Uh, so we got the final date. It came out as late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, so 1300 BC to uh, 600 BC. That's early. Yeah. Yeah, it was earlier than a lot of people expected. Wow. So definitive evidence that the Uffington White Horse is seriously old. It's not Anglo-Saxon, it's Bronze Age. This horse has a pedigree of 3,000 years. So when Bodfox stamped his coin with the horse in 30 BC, our Uffington steed was already as much as 1,000 years old. That makes it one of the oldest pieces of land art in the world. So we know a date, but we're talking the Bronze Age here, not the Power Tool Age. How on earth did they go about carving this massive design into the hillside 3,000 years ago? Helpfully, at around the same time the horse was dated, a horde of Bronze Age axe heads and other artifacts were found close by. Exactly the sort of tools the locals used back then. Over to you, Clive. Your turn for some manual labour. Well, anything Bronze Age man can do, surely a late Middle Age man can do better. Especially if you've got head of horse maintenance, Andy Foley, in charge. Right. So, we are going to discover, I'm going to discover how easy or hard it is uh, to dig into this soil. OK. I, I think a whole white horse, 100 yards long, is a bit beyond me. So, um, what shall I attempt? Like a small West Highland white or something? <laughs> OK. <laughs> let's try, a, let's try a, a trench here. Yes. And, and see how we get on. Yeah. Luckily, I've got a modern tool, if okay. I may put it like that. Yep. And uh, so I'm going to dig in here. And there you go. My modern spade may have the edge on a Bronze Age axe head, but I'm only a few inches in and I'm already wishing Mary Ann was here instead. And how far have I got to get down along the, this way? The horse is established on trenches a metre deep. So a metre deep? That's my hip to the floor, so that's quite a long way down. I've got a long way to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Would have been very fit people, but they didn't live very long. That was the only... I don't know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> is that a ceremonial pickaxe, Andy? Feel free to pitch in any time. That's it. Look at that. So you've only got another 105 metres to go. Yeah. When it comes to encouragement, Andy's clearly more of a stick than a carrot man. Better distract him with some horse chat. Somebody must have had the plan of what it's going to look like from a distance. Yeah. But have we any idea? how they communicated that to each other. Was there somebody standing on the other side of the, uh, the valley saying, down a bit, more a bit, you've left his ear out? The most likely theory is that they would have set out huge, great canvases, perhaps yes. made of leather or, or, yeah. and, and, and marked around them. Marked uh, their design out on the ground, yes. That's it. But this is just the two of us doing this. And by the two of us, I mean, well, just me. So how many people would be necessary to fill the whole horse? Uh, hundreds. Hundreds. H hundreds, I'd say, yes. All right, I think we need some more recruits to, to get involved in this. I think so, yeah. yeah. Well, I admit my tiny trench has a long way to go to look like Uffington's finest. It's clear creating that must have been a massive communal project. But Bronze Age life was centred on farming and survival. So why choose a horse to pour all this effort into? Why not a cow? Or a chicken. The Uffington chicken? Not exactly catchy, is it, Clive? But it is a good question. Why is it a horse? Hot on. To try to answer that, I've come to South Devon to meet one of the closest living relatives of the Bronze Age horse, the Dartmoor Hill Pony. Charlotte Faulkner has been working with this ancient breed her whole life. Looking at these ponies, they're compact, they're strong, they're quite pretty. Is this the kind of horse that they had exactly, 4,000 years ago? Exactly that sort. And the reason we know that is we, the hoof print, we measured it, and it's the same size. The formula for a horse's leg and foot and how, what size it ends up is what starts at the bottom. Right, so we know they were that size. 
Wild horses have lived in Britain for thousands of years, but it was in the Bronze Age when they were first domesticated. What kind of things would horses have been used for by those, those Bronze Age farmers? They would have used them for riding, carrying stuff in panniers, driving them, which we do a lot of, because um, so, they've got such stamina. In an era not renowned for its quality of life, the domestication of the horse must have been a real upgrade. Instead of hauling loads by hand, suddenly you've got the equivalent of a Bronze Age tractor. Even better, they were as tough as old boots. They are incredible. I mean, even things like their coats, they have a really fluffy, woolly undercoat, and then they have a shiny overcoat with longer hairs, which acts as sort of drains to keep the rain off them, and these great heavy manes and things. So they're just built for surviving, really. So you can leave these horses out on the wild, windswept moors all winter, no coat, no extra food, and in the spring, they're as good as they were before. Yes, and that's because for generations that's what they've done. So it's survival of the fittest, that's what semi-wild is all about. Mother Nature has made them tough. Yeah, it has, really tough. Wow. <laughs> On the hillside in Uffington, people went to the trouble of carving a giant horse. Does that make sense to you, that they were revering this animal? Oh, I think it definitely makes sense. But if you had chalk, you'd do a horse too? Yeah, I think we would. <laughs> No wonder Bronze Age people carved a horse on the hillside at Uffington. The horse must have changed their world. What do you think of the horse? Well, is it a horse? Clearly a horse. Clearly a horse. I reckon horse. It's so stylized a creature. Mm. Uh, it could almost be a cat, couldn't it, with its tail? And it's got its funny little whiskers. Yeah. It's obviously the horses they actually have in that period yeah. are kind of stubby little ponies. I mean, they don't look like these beautiful, elongated, abstract thoroughbreds, you know, yeah. galloping across the, across the hillsides. But, this, but the style of it is so, so good, because it, it's not strictly representational. It's, it's, it's a piece of artwork you could have done in the 1950s or Picasso's white period or something. I think that's why it's so compelling to us now, isn't it? Because mm. it's this extraordinary thing that we've inherited from our ancient ancestors. Uh, what they've originally done, it takes quite a lot of effort to do it, having, having tried digging in, in the chalk, obviously... Yeah, uh, you've you got could... your, your digging muscles yeah. on. How was it? Well it, it, it? well, it was doable, but it wasn't just, oh, let's scratch a thing. You have to dig a bit. Now, uh, the time have to be spent to do that, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's work to be done, you're assuming, growing the crops or chasing animals, whatever else you're doing to keep everybody alive. So you've got to devote some resources. And I think that's the biggest mystery of all. Why? Why would Bronze Age man put this much effort into a monument they couldn't even see from the ground? Actually, Clive, who says it was for them? The argument is that it's actually connected to a supernatural being. and I are uncovering the myths and legends of the mysterious Uffington White Horse. We now know it was created by Bronze Age people around 3,000 years ago. But why put all this effort into a monument you can't really appreciate until someone invents flying? Who's it for? Who's to see it? Why is it there? Well, Clive, you're assuming it was created solely for human appreciation. But archaeologist Professor Josh Pollard thinks the direction in which the horse is galloping is an indication it had a much higher purpose. The horse is laid out in such a way that its head is facing over to the west. It implies movement. It's supposed to be an image of something running, moving with the sun. And that leads to the idea of it being something called a sun horse. What is a sun horse? Well, it, it, it sounds a very peculiar thing that during the Bronze Age, they had a, an idea, a mythological idea, that the sun was guided through the sky during the day by a supernatural horse and then carried through the underworld at night on a supernatural boat. So this combination of horse and boat basically enabled the sun to uh, take its journey, its daily journey, through the sky and through the underworld. What evidence do we have of this sort of mythology of the sun horse? What we do have are depictions of sun horses found on metalwork from places like Denmark. Okay. 
And one particularly famous example is the so-called Trondheim Chariot. The Trondheim Chariot was dug up from a Danish peat bog in 1902. It's just under two feet in length and dates to around the same time the White Horse was built in Uffington. And it's a little bronze horse yes. on wheels yes. towing, is that the sun? Well, well yes, I mean, chariot. what we have is a large bronze disc and onto that bronze disc we have this sheet of gold and you can see how the gold is decorated with a series of circular motifs. Yeah, it's beautiful. Josh doesn't think the Uffington horse is a god, more like a mystical method of transport, a sort of celestial taxi, if you will. And the sun was certainly a powerful theme throughout the ancient world at this time. The Egyptians believed the sun god Ra was reborn each morning at sunrise. While in Greece, Helios drove his golden chariot daily from east to west across the sky. So this is almost like a, a global religion, but 3,000 years ago. That's right, yes, yes, very, very similar beliefs and, and very persistent beliefs as well. Although the position of the horse seems very peculiar to us now, put yourself in the shoes of a Bronze Age sun worshipper and things become a bit clearer. So the thinking is that this horse is where it is, i.e. not very visible, because it's not actually supposed to be seen by the likes of you and me. That's right. We could, at one level, just think of it as being a, a symbol for the gods. So really, the best perspective comes from above. Time to get the drone out again. OK. Only this time, I'm in the driving seat. Woo, look at that. Very good. <laughs> it is good, this. Something the Bronze Age folk never, ever got to see. Never imagined. Right, so, so that, that's the best view, isn't it, by far? all of a sudden you can actually see the entirety of the figure in a way that you never can from the ground. They could imagine that this was how it appeared from the sky, but they would never have this perspective. That's extraordinary. For 3,000 years, no human had this view. But if the sun horse theory is right, once we stopped worshipping the sun, why did people continue maintaining the horse? Could it be that as new cultures, religions and people took over the area, this magnificent carving was just, well, too mystical to ignore? A mile down the valley from the horse is something that might just support that idea. Local master blacksmith David Gregory is also an expert in English folklore. But this was a burial chamber. This was indeed. So when was that? What era was these? This is uh, late Neolithic. So Stone Age into Bronze Age sort yeah. of times. Yeah, so very, very ancient then. Very ancient. Although we now know this is a Neolithic burial chamber, the Anglo-Saxons who arrived in the 5th century hadn't quite mastered archaeology yet. For them, this was clearly the home for one of their gods, Wayland. Who or what was Wayland? Wayland is the Anglo-Saxon's blacksmith god. Yes. It's a mixture of a number of legends. Effectively, he represents the god who brought mystical weapons and jewellery to people from seemingly nowhere. Somebody who could give you a sword that you could then smite your enemy and, yeah. and, and bring more power to your tribe. But that's presumably the door in there, so it's yeah. quite a low door. Was, was Wayland a small? God of smithing? Depending on the legend, he was either a giant or a dwarf or a giant dwarf. I'd say the evidence here is he was fairly small. Small or not, the Anglo-Saxons took the Wayland legend and added the white horse to their story. Because what do magical blacksmiths do when they're not knocking up mystical swords? They shoe mystical horses, don't they? So the white horse... The white horse... Would come here? All the, all the smith went to the horse, but I, I believe the horse came here in yes. some of the, the legends. Uh, and so if you caught it right, you'd see the denuded hill. Yeah. But by the morning, you would again see uh, the horse there, but with fresh hooves. Far bit for me to point out that our Picasso-like horse doesn't actually have hooves, but it was good enough for the Anglo-Saxons. They absorbed the giant horse into their own beliefs and continued the tradition of maintaining it probably for fear of putting Wayland out of a job. It's a brilliant story, Clive. But despite hundreds of years of speculation, 
No one has ever come up with a plausible reason for the horse's location at this particular spot. Until now. Amateur geologist Ned Pegler has a very interesting theory for the birth of the Uffington horse. And it's got nothing to do with gods or magic or even humans. Ned, we're here in Uffington Village and the white horse is just... Just there. visible, yeah. You've got a theory as to why it might be there. Yes, it looks to me as a geologist remarkably like a landslip. There is an event which is fairly well known to climatologists, which is across northwestern Europe, around 800 to about 600 BC, there was a period of extreme wetness. And it is just possible that you could maybe say that there was a landslip at this time of a scale that you just don't see now. Ned's theory is that the ground in this exact position where the horse now gallops became so waterlogged it caused a landslide exposing the white chalk beneath the topsoil. We've got a demonstration here, which is a, a cup of oregano. So this is our grass. This is supposed to be the surface. OK. And this is chalk, and I'm trying to make sure that we cover the chalk. OK, so... So now we're just going to try gently shaking this, and ah, okay. we start to get what you could think of as a small chalk scarp appearing. And it will be perhaps more than one white mark. We may have a number of cracks that have opened up in the ground, which are forming a series of arcs. So you're not saying that this horse figure, as we see it now, was suddenly revealed no, no. as the grass that would slumped be... down on, after a particularly heavy rainstorm? That would be a very special miracle to have something <laughs> like that happen. But maybe something of the shape, something that people saw, noticed and went, oh! <gasps> So I think people might see a body, they might see a tail, they might see something hinting at legs. Something would remind them of a horse. And I suppose if you're living in a world where you believe genuinely that a godlike horse draws the sun across the sky mm -hmm. and suddenly there's a horse-ish shape revealed on a hillside, that genuinely would be a miracle. That's a sign. It is a sign. It's not too far of a stretch to think that the local tribes wanted to protect their divine sign, maybe even enhance its horsiness and maintain it. 3,000 years later, via many other cultures and religions, it's become an age-old tradition in the area to protect the horse, even if no one can quite remember why. Solved it, that's it, sorted. Yes, that's it. Huffington um, horse, done. Everybody can go home. <laughs> well, that's an idea. Maybe Bronze Age man carved the horse into the hillside to worship their gods. Or maybe the gods started it all with a rainstorm. Either way, if I were a gambling man, I'd bet the horse will still be here for another 3,000 years. Well, I suggest we take a leaf out of the book of the pagans and go and have a drink. Maybe they did convert me after all. I love Ned's theory, mm. which is the reason it's there is because of an accident of nature. And then human beings, you know, being what we are, we go, oh, look, a sign, or oh, look, it's the start of a story. And we, you know, we read things in into yeah. very natural phenomena. I love the Uffington horse mm. because it's such an enigma. And the thing that's clear about it is that every single generation since prehistory has mm. loved it for some reason and kept it alive. Yes, it's odd. That's the most uh, fantastic thing about it. It's thousands of years of people returning to it, maybe every year, every couple of years, and digging it out or whatever's necessary to keep yeah. it going. And it's a brilliant reason, isn't it? You go up, do a bit of weeding, and then have a massive party. But why is it still there? 3,000 years later. I think it's because every single generation has found a reason to keep it going. Uh, you know, every generation gets the horse it deserves and wants. <laughs> <laughs>